We are in our second um, message in our new series, Christmas Playlist, talking about Christmas carols and things that we sing today. And if you missed last week because of the snow, go online, check it out. It was really good. We enjoyed it. But this week, we're talking about the Mariah Carey song, All I Want for Christmas is You. It was released through Columbia Records in October 29th, 1994. How many of y'all in here weren't even born yet? 94. Put your hand down. Yeah. <laughs> in, in the years since its original release, All I Want for Christmas is You has actually been a critically acclaimed song. It was once called one of the few worthy modern additions to the holiday canon. It's become established as a Christmas standard and continues to surge in popularity. It's actually one of the top 10 most popular songs uh, on the charts today. And as we look at our Christmas playlist, don't shout out, don't shout out, but we're talking about all I want for Christmas is you. I said don't shout out. She, there's <laughs> got to be one in the room. What's on your Christmas list this year? What's on your Christmas list this year? Have you checked it? Have you found the best deals? Have you looked it up? Are you one of those people that are easy to shop for? Or are you one of those people who are impossible to shop for? Because we, we know both types, right? We know the easy type. You get them anything and they open it and they're like, oh my God, you're just so amazing. This is great. And it was socks. And it really, that kind of person, the gift itself didn't really matter, but the simple fact that you thought of them, that's what makes them feel so great. But then there's the flip side. There's the other person who opens the same sock gift, and they're like, this is not what I asked for for Christmas. Right? And at that moment, you just want to take everything they own and throw it outside on the driveway. Right? It's so ungrateful. There's another type of person who's impossible to shop for because they're the person who has everything. And what do you buy the person who already has everything? Or the means by which to go out and buy it themselves, right? Mariah Carey sings a song and she says this, I don't want a lot for Christmas. There's just one thing I need. And I don't care about the presents underneath the Christmas tree, right? She says, I just want you for my own more than you could ever know. Make my wish come true. All I want for Christmas is you, boo. <laughs> and all the romantics in the room, they're like, aww. And all the non-romantics are like, ew. And all the married people are like, yeah, right. I want you to bring me my Christmas gift on Christmas morning, right? <laughs> Mariah Carey sings a song, All I Want for Christmas is You. And as I was planning this out and thinking about the holidays, I was thinking maybe there might be someone in here today who you have a broken relationship with somebody and your song would be, All I Want for Christmas is Anyone But You. I don't want you around me. I don't want you at my house for Christmas. I don't want you around my kids. I'll take anybody. I'll, I'll take someone I don't even know. Strangers could come over my house, but not you. Amen. <laughs> We're going to hand out some duct tape in a minute. <laughs> when not to say amen in church. <laughs> at the heart of Humanity at the heart of Christianity. Really, our heartbeat should be all I want for Christmas is my relationships to work. All I want for Christmas is my relationships, my relatives, my friends to love each other, to have a great time. And sometimes relationships get out of whack the closer we get to Christmas, and anxiety begins to rise up because people that you've managed to avoid all year long are now coming to your house for Christmas, right? You know you've had those conversations. 
Your, your spouse needs to go to their relatives for a holiday party and you're like, I don't want to go. Do I have to go? Tell them I'm sick. Right? And the anxiety of being around these people and having to do these holiday things, people that you don't like, that you have something against, that anxiety in and of itself ends up making you sick. It's no wonder why it's flu season around the holidays. Huh? Because of worry and stress and all these other things that come upon us. Right? I'm here to teach today on the subject of relationships. How do we go about the process of changing our negative feelings that we have towards people. I'm going to talk today about this. How to get out of negative situations and negative relationships. And in fact, the Apostle Paul talks about it in a New Testament book called Philippians. Philippians is a book written to the church at Philippi that he had founded 10 years earlier than this writing. And he's saying that there's a lot of issues going on at this church there was a lot of relationship problems. They, they were building a healthy church, but the relationships within the church were broken. People were talking about each other. They were backstabbing. Relationships were just on the fritz. They, they were just nasty to each other. And Paul's shouting out to them, I need to fix some stuff. And this is what he writes in Philippians 2 verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any communion sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by, and he's saying, okay, here's some things we got to fix. I need you to be like-minded, like-minded, okay? Having the same love. Could you imagine if we all had the same love? Being one in spirit and one mind. Watch this. Now, this is the heavy one. This is like, are you really kidding me, Paul? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I'm going to give a shout out to all the singles in the house, all the singles who have not been married yet. I'm just telling you right now, you may think that you're the most chill, loving, caring person in the world, but the moment you get married, you're going to realize how selfish you are. You can realize how selfish you are. In fact, you don't even know, you don't know you're selfish until you're involved in a relationship where you have to share stuff. Okay? You got to share stuff. Let's just talk this out for two seconds. Right? Uh, it's the end of the week. It ain't payday yet. You got $100 left in the account. And you're like, yo, I want to go buy something with that $100. And so you go to spend that $100 and then your significant other says, wait a second. I've got plans for that $100. Well, whose hundred dollars is it? <laughs> when I was single, I could spend my money on whatever I want to spend my money on. But now that I'm with you, you spend all my money. Come on, you being quiet because you know that's happened. You know that's happened. They say, listen, don't do anything out of selfish ambition. Are we, are we thinking about one another? Rather, watch this, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then there's a semicolon here, right? And in your Bible, you'll see that it's broken out a little bit differently. The writing looks different. And verses 6 through 8, Paul is actually reciting a hymn, uh, like, like out of a hymnal. Now, we don't know this in our hymns today, but this was a very known hymn of the time, a carol, if you will, that Paul is reciting. And he says this, so be like Christ, who... Being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So he had all the power to say drop dead. And they would drop dead. But he didn't use it. He never used the divine power that he had to his own advantage. Watch. But rather, 
he made himself nothing by taking the nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Scripture goes on, but I want to jump down to verse 12 and rest in on verse 12 for a minute. He says this, therefore, my dear friends, so he's writing to the church, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, watch what he says here, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This has been a passage of Scripture that I've seen used my entire life. I've been in church for 40 years, okay? And, and it always happens when two people are in a discussion where they really just want to end it. They're Christians. They know the Bible. They just want to shut the other person up. They say, ah, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. As if it's a theological verse, okay? We disagree theologically, so I'm just going to tell you, well, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But I want to take a minute and look at this. That this, has, this is not a theological statement or scripture. This is a relational scripture. The whole passage is talking about relationships. How to deal with one another. Love one another. Care for one another. Why would he then switch to theology? He wouldn't. This word salvation here is not the word sozo in the Greek. The word sozo in the Greek means eternal life or your heaven salvation. It's not saying work out your eternal relationship with God with fear and trembling because you can't do that. You can't work out your salvation. You can't work out your eternal life. There's nothing good enough you can do to get God to love you more. There's nothing you can do bad enough to get God to love you any less. God chose you. You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God is responsible for your eternal life. Look it up in your own, look it up in your own Bible, in your own study. This word here is not sozo, it's the word soteria. Soteria. And it actually means to work out your own safety and your health. It's got the connotation to say, work out your own emotional health with fear and trembling. So in light of the context that we're talking about relationships, He's saying, go work out your relationships with other people. Go work it out. And isn't it funny that the thing that we do when we get to a spot where we don't want to deal with somebody anymore, I'll just pray for them. You know what? I'm just going to let God handle it. And God says, but I give it to you to handle. Yeah, but I'm going to let God handle it. But I'm giving it to you to handle. I'm telling you to go work the relationship out. Yeah, but I'm just going to give it to the Lord. But he said, go work it out. Can, can, can you see the little dilemma here? Why Paul is having to talk to this church like, guys, you're not getting it. You're supposed to handle your relationships because you're a Christian. That's the message of this chapter. Not relationships. I mean, not theology, but relationships. Can you say this with me real quick? I'm going to put it up on the screen. I can change my feelings. Say that. But do you believe that? Do you believe that you can change your feelings? Because there's a lot of people who believe that they're victims of their feelings. So let me just, just real quick, like, I find out your deepest, darkest secret, the thing that you're most ashamed of, that you would just be mortified, embarrassed if anybody ever found out. And I came up here on a Sunday and say, hey guys, just real quick, I just want you guys to know that so-and-so's biggest secret is this. And I just say it in front of a thousand people. Can you control the way you feel about that? You would say you can't. Well, how could I? You did that to me. You, no, no, no. You are in charge of your feelings. Well, I'm going to put it this way. You feel the way you feel because you think the way you think. Okay? You feel that nobody likes you because all you keep telling yourself in your mind is nobody likes me. You feel anger and resentment and embarrassment because someone told your secret, because you told yourself, if anybody ever finds out, 
My life is over. I'm humiliated. I don't know if I can live with it. You told yourself that story. And so now when it happened, you're feeling the way you told yourself to feel. But I can change my feelings. A lot of times we feel, well, there's nothing I can do about the way I feel. This is just the way I feel. Yes, you can. Change the way you think. Change the way you think. Right? There's a whole lot you can do about the way you feel. In fact, you're the only person that can change the way you feel. And that's what this entire chapter, Philippians chapter 2, is about. Changing your feelings. Changing your feelings. I'm just going to throw this one out there to you today. Nobody shout out, please. But there might be someone in here who you are going through a breakup, you are going through a divorce, or you have gone through a divorce. And the moment someone says something about your ex, bam! Emotions just come all over you. You are responsible for that. You are responsible for that. You are responsible for what comes out of your mouth after somebody says something to you about an ex. And you feel those things and all those emotions come up because of all the self-talk that you tell yourself. See, when true forgiveness happens, there's nothing that could ever happen again that could make me feel that way again. It's gone. And if those emotions are still there, you haven't fully forgiven. Come on, I'm just helping somebody today. This is not my notes. This is something's going on with somebody in here today. And you're still feeling anxiety. You're still feeling depression. You're still feeling shame or regret. Or anger rises up every time you hear about that person. There's somebody in here. Every time you look at your kid, you see your spouse. And you've taken it out on them because you resent them because they look like and remind you. I'm just saying today, you are responsible for that. He says you can change it. The first thing that Paul says, if we're going to have healthy relationships, is that we have to be like-minded. Like-minded. Now here's the facts about this word like-minded. This does not mean that we all have to think alike. We're not going to think alike. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different cultural upbringings. We all come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. We're not going to think the same way. My wife still thinks it's acceptable to take rice that she's done cooking and put the whole pot in the fridge. She thinks that's acceptable. Mira! Something about how you heat the rice back up and the big ow. And, uh, if you're Dominican, you get con con. And I'm like, yo, straight up, put it in Tupperware. Tupperware. So I have leftovers at work. <laughs> Nobody's on my side, I'm alone. I'm alone here today. (laughs) Being like-minded does not mean that we have to think alike. Being like-minded means that when we disagree, we need to do it agreeably. Disagreeing agreeably means we can have two different points of view and we don't hate each other. I just saw a new doctor this week. And as I walk in, he was an Orthodox Jewish man. And we had the most interesting conversations about, I mean, obviously, as soon as he asked, what do you do for a living, it was on. (laughs) But I mean, literally, like a 30-minute doctor visit was like an hour and 15 minutes long. And 90% of the conversation had nothing to do with me, but about our, our, our beliefs and our faith. And it was interesting. And he asked me some straight stuff, man. And I told him my beliefs. And he was like, well, maybe. And then he said something back. I said, well, that's because you're Jewish. And you know, like we had like slams back and forth. And it was good. But there was no anger. There was no resentment. 
And at the end of the conversation, I was like, he's probably my favorite doctor I've ever had. Like, I love this guy. I want this, I want this to be my doctor. But have you ever met a person who has no tools to agreeably disagree? Like, they're always right. Everything they say, you have to agree with or you're an idiot. Like, it's not even like you're wrong. No, no, you're wrong, I'm right. No, no, you're an idiot. Like, you're the dumbest person that's ever existed because you don't see it the way they see it. Come on, we all know somebody. They might be sitting right next to you. Don't amen. <laughs> There's a way to disagree agreeably where we don't get angry. Could you imagine having a disagreement where we don't get angry? Where we intellectually disagree to resolve the situation? Oh my gosh, let's disagree about the kids. Let's disagree about the kids and see how well that one goes down, right? We don't have to be hateful when someone has a different political view than we have. Oh, God. Let's just save our Christmas dinner and don't bring up politics, right? There's a way to hold a different opinion than somebody else in a loving and gentle way. And this is what the Apostle Paul's saying. He's saying, you guys, listen to what I'm about to say right now. He says, you guys are arguing in a way that is displeasing to God. You're arguing in a way that's displeasing to God. He said, no, you need to be like-minded. You need to be like-minded. You need to be able to have conversations that you don't agree about but in a peaceable way. The second thing he says is this, overlook small offenses. Overlook small offenses. The Bible specifically says that the glory of the king is to overlook small offenses. And I think that we've lost the ability in America today to overlook small offenses. Just as Christians, we're driving down the road, someone cuts us off, we start screaming, you didn't see my car, blah, blah. Hey, can we just wait till we get out of the church parking lot to do that stuff? <laughs> Let's at least get out of the parking lot before we behave that way and lose our mind and scream, right? No one can make you angry because they cut you off on the road. No one holds that power but you. You choose. Listen, there's this thing called flight or fight or freeze. Right? They added freeze because some people don't do either. Just It is the same chemical reaction in your body to fight, to flight, or to freeze. It's the same chemical reaction in your body to laugh or to cry. But you're in control of which one you choose. Depending on your internal thinking and your programming, you choose which one and how you respond. He says, listen, Paul is saying, it's just wrong for Christians to deal with one another the way the world does. And sometimes worse. He says, it's wrong. We should not be dealing with each other in anger. The person, and I'm just throwing this out there to married couples. The person that you chose, I will protect you. In good times and bad times, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, I will stand by your side. Has now become your emotional punching bag. And that's not what I signed up for. He says, it's wrong. It's wrong. He says, gentleness of Christ, being like-minded, that we can hold different points of view and still love one another. Disagree agreeably, overlooking small offenses. And then he says this, 
The next step is to be humble. I'm humble. You're so humble, you're proud of it. This means you ain't humble, Papa. And this was an odd one for the people that Paul was talking to because they had a big Greco-Roman historical influence. They're very macho, very it's my way or no way. And now Paul's talking about being humble. Being Being humble with one another was just weird to them. This idea that they would be humble and kind just didn't resound with them. And Paul is saying, but this is what brings relationships together. Humility brings relationships together. In your workplace, humility draws people together. Pride and arrogance pushes people apart. Nobody wants to work with the arrogant coworker. Nobody wants to work with the know-it-all. Everybody wants to work with the nice person, the humble person. The peaceable person. I can remember learning this lesson the hard way. I was 17 years old. I was at a a camp. My grandfather uh, took me and my cousin to this camp to shoot, uh, to shoot guns like for two weeks straight. It was like the greatest thing ever. And um, I was really good in my age bracket. In fact, I was, they called me a top gun in my, in my age bracket. And uh, we, we even did those things where you walk through a town and doors open and there's a silhouette and you have to like, I mean, it's just cool stuff, right? And I was top gun in my age bracket. And that's all I cared about, man, was my points and my stats. And I go back to my bunk and I had all like my shell casings lined up as like how many targets I shit, shot and, and I had all the, 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 whatever, all the targets and everything. And it comes to the last day where they're going to give the camper of the year award. And I'm like, yo, I got it because I hit all my, I was the top gun of the whole camp. Like, I just knew it. And they call somebody else up for camp of the year. And I'm sitting there, I'm angry. I'm like, wait, nobody else shot me. I was the best shot. And they're like, for character and integrity and team building and humility. I thought we were at a gun camp. Worst of all, they call my cousin up. My cousin. I'm still feeling salty about that. Right? (laughs) He was the camper of the year because he was caring about other people. I'm like trying to fist fight people. And he's like, I love you. You're doing great. That's a great shot. (laughs) Hum, humility draws people together. It's a basic ethical principle. Thinking about the well-being of others before yourself. And thinking about others, not just immediate family. But you're on the grocery line, you got this huge cart, and you got someone there with five items. Could they go before you? Why do they got to go, for, go to the self-checkout? <laughs> the Bible tells us that if you have ought against your brother, what are you supposed to do? Go to them. You're supposed to go to them. If you have a problem with somebody, you're supposed to go to them. And, and the Bible says this, by doing that, you are drawn closer to your heavenly father. So real quick, in the next few minutes that we have together, I want to jump into something called triangulation or negative triangles, relation, negative relationship triangles. It's a little bit of psychology, and I'm not going to try to lose you in the psychology, But it's a biblical principle, okay? You with me? So let's check this out today. Put put the first image up on the screen. There's you, there's John, and there's Fred. Okay? There's you, and the line's pointing at Fred. You're mad at Fred. You got a problem with Fred. You're annoyed with Fred. For whatever reason, you're mad at somebody. I'm, I'm the you. I'm mad at Fred. Yo, he went out and bought the sneakers that I was going to buy. He knew I was going to buy those sneakers. 
And before I could get those sneakers, he went and got those sneakers. You can see why I'm, why I'm upset today, right? That's not right. So I'm upset at Fred, and rightfully so. Whatever you're upset about, you believe, rightfully so, I'm upset. And you've been okay with Fred. He's over there, we're good. But it's now Christmas time, and Fred's coming over to my house for Christmas. He's pocketing with the sneakers. Now all this anxiety is welling up. I don't know what I'm going to do because I'm going to have to see Fred. And you've managed this relationship from a distance, but now he's coming to your house. You're feeling all this anxiety. But instead of going to Fred to talk to Fred about it, who do you go to? John. Next image. You go to John. You go to John because John understands me. And you go to John because John always understands you. You go to John... Because John doesn't like confrontation just as much as you don't like confrontation. Right? You go to John because John is always on your side. You don't go to Fred because you don't want to confront Fred. You go to John, you say, yo, Fred is just irritating me. Fred got the same sneakers that I wanted. And what does John say to you? I can completely understand your side. (laughs) Because John is always understanding. John's always understanding, that's why you keep going to John. You know, all the Johns in the room that think, you know, maybe I should be a counselor because everyone comes to me and talks to me about their problems. (laughs) You need to ask yourself, what is it about me that everybody thinks they can come dump their garbage on me? What is it about me that everybody keeps putting me in their unhealthy relationship triangles and I'm a willing participant? John's, you're wrong. John's, mind your business. <laughs> right? That's why you keep going to John because John's always understanding. But over time, John develops the attitude that you have with Fred. Yeah! Why did he get those sneakers? <laughs> Fred's messed up, bro. You were going to wear those on stage, and they were going to look awesome under the lights. But no, now Fred had to wear them, and he put them on his gram. Now everybody already saw them. Now if you get them, you're a poser. Yo, John, I didn't think about that. Now John got it all amped up. John's got me amped up right now. So now you and John are buddied up. You're both upset at Fred, but a plot twist is about to happen. We're going to come back to that in a second. Come back to that in a second. The apostle Paul was connected with multiple people as well. But Paul was not in a negative relationship triangle. Paul was involved in something called a three-stranded cord. And in Ecclesiastes 4.12, it says this, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Let's look at this braid for a second. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about being paired up with two other people who are like-minded, who are going in the same direction. This relationship can take a lot of pressure. I'm going to see if I get this right. I can't reach that far. It can take a lot of pressure when it's pulled on like this. It's very strong. That's why it's braided. A triangle, pull on one corner, it snaps like a wishbone. He's saying here, a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. Let me ask you today, are you in strong relationships of three or are you in negative triangles? Have you been in a participant of gossiping relationships, talking about somebody else with no resolution to the situation? Well, how can I tell? You can tell if you're in one of these when you're bothered by somebody and instead of going to them, you go to somebody else. Yeah, but I'm just, I'm just talking to my spouse Oh, so that makes it so much better. Now, you just brought your spouse into an unhealthy negative triangle. 
Yeah, but that's who I talk to. No, no. It needs to be life-giving conversations. You made them an unwilling partner in your negative triangle. And here's the problem. Well, I'm just going to bring my spouse into it. Here's the problem. They call these triangles dynamic triangles. They're always changing. A negative triangle keeps the drama going. It just keeps the drama going on and on. There's no end to this. The negative triangle has no power in and of itself to end the drama. So here's what happens. Unhealthy participants will take their turn as the odd man out. So watch what happens when you and Fred discover you've both been talking to John. Huh? We're both talking to John. Because they're upset at each other. I'm upset. So now Fred finds out we both are talking to John. So now Fred and John, huh, what do they do? They pair up on me. Now I'm the odd man out. Fred figures, up, Fred figures out that you're upset at him, and now he goes to John. Fred says, I don't understand why Mike is so upset at me. I went to the mall. I saw these sneakers that were on sale. It was Black Friday. Excuse me. <laughs> and so I bought them. I didn't know. I didn't know he wanted those sneakers. And John's like, John, John told you. What did John tell you? I can totally understand why you're upset at Fred, didn't he? Yes. But when he's confronted by Fred, because Fred likes to confront you and John don't. When confronted by Fred, what does he tell Fred? He told you, I can totally understand, Mike, why you're upset at Fred. Fred confronts him. What does he tell Fred? No. He, I can't understand why Mike's mad at you at all. I can't understand Mike. I don't know why he's so upset at you. You didn't know what kind of sneakers he wanted to buy. Huh? And what's happened? I'm now the odd man out. There's a shift in the triangle. John and Fred become in a close relationship, and I'm the odd man out. But what do you think is going to happen next? It's going to change again because it's always shifting, right? When me and Fred find out that John's been telling us both what we want to hear, me and, Fred are, me and Fred are besties. But me and Fred, we're not talking about kicks. We're talking about John. We, we totally forgot. The whole point was the fact that he got my sneakers. Now, dude, can you believe Fred? I thought he was my friend. Yeah, I thought he was my friend too. Telling us, but double playing us back and forth. Guys, you don't realize this. But you do this all the time. All the time. Every time you go to someone else other than the person who created the offense, you create a negative relationship triangle. And it's always adjusting. It's always moving. Eventually, when you were playing monkey in the middle for your two friends, here's how you know you stepped into it. You want me to go talk to them for you? Are you crazy? We've done this since we were kids. Hey, Bobby, I like Sally. Can you go ask Sally if she likes me too? <laughs> and it's become part of who we are. We've done it our whole life lives. Now we're at this age, we're all grown-ups, and we don't know how to deal with relationships because we've never had to. Three quick keys today to how to get out of these, how to have a conversation with somebody that you're having a hard time with. Number one, go to them privately. Go to them privately. Do not, oh my God, please, can I just throw something out there? Please do not be one of those passive aggressive people who put an obscure post on social media. Wish they would just leave me alone. 
Now everyone's like, who? Who are you talking about? Who are you asking to leave you alone? Oh, I know exactly who you're talking about, boo. I'm with you. Like, you're 55 years old. That was middle school. That was middle school stuff. Go to them privately. Number two, go to them gently. Number three, go to them humbly. Go to them humbly. The Bible tells us this right here in Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, if your brother offends you, go and tell him his fault between you and him. Say it out loud. Alone. Alone. Well, could you just go with me because, you know, I... Alone. Look somebody in their eyes. Tell them straight out, this is what's going on. This is what's going on. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. We can do better. We can do better. We can have better relationships. We can have a better holiday season, right? Here, here's a key. When you feel this happening, someone's trying to draw you in or you wanting to jump in, say no. Say no. There's something I'm working on here at staff. When someone tries to draw you into a project that you don't have time to, say no. Yeah, but I'm trying to be good. Say no. It's hard to say no. It's an easy concept. It's an easy theory. Say no. But if you've never been in the practice of saying no, of setting boundaries in your life, it can actually be very difficult. Say no. Let me just show you what this looks like. Yo, Mike, did you hear what so-and-so did to me? No. Okay, so let me tell you. No. No, but you got to hear this. this is, no. Did you go to them and talk to them about it? Are you crazy? No. Yeah, but that's, but that's so hard, like, for me to be put in that situation. But no, no. The problem is, the problem is, we say, no, I don't like no drama. We love drama. Did you hear what John did to me? What? No, no, no. Now, now that you know it, now that they spent, no, no, it's okay. I don't want to be part of this. It's too late. It's too late. You're in. You know it. Now you already got some sort of feelings. Now you already got that person's side of the story. It don't matter who you are. Some part of you says, I got to go ask them if this is true. You're now in the dynamic triangle. You're playing both sides. Say no. You see something going on and you want to be a help, then put this up on the screen. Choose to be a resource, not a participant. Choose to be a resource, not a participant. Someone comes and says, hey, did you hear what was going on with so-and-so? Okay, did you go to them privately? Did you go to them gently? Did you go to them humbly? Give them tools. I'm not, I'm not being involved. I don't want to know. I'm asking you. You're coming to tell me something. Did you go to them privately? Did you go to them gently? Did you go to them humbly? I can, I can give you some tools, but no. I'm not getting involved in this. I can see where you're at. I'm here to help you, but I can't be involved. We've got a few weeks till Christmas. Some of us are going to have some people in our lives in this next few weeks that have hurt us, that have caused some very real wounds. There's going to be some people that you're going to be surrounded with in the next few weeks that you inflicted some serious wounds. And to you, ah, knock it off, it was no big deal, but to them it was very real. This holiday season, I'm just trying to connect with you for a moment. We can do better. We can heal these moments. We can have conversations that we've been avoiding for years. We can... Remain emotionally unshaken. We don't have to get angry. We don't have to blow up. I implore you today that if you can't have a conversation with somebody because you're afraid of them or there's a history of anger or there's a history of violence, then get a mediator. Get a mediator. 
Go to somebody who gets paid to do that, a paid counselor. If there's something in your life that you're so ashamed of, man, I don't know who I'm talking to today. If there's something in your life that you're so ashamed of that you carry this fear around that if anybody ever finds out what I've done, and because of that fear and because of that shame, you're angry at other people and you shame other people. I ask you, go see a counselor, a paid counselor, someone that you can talk to that can never, ever, ever tell your secret. They're, they, they legally can't. But there's a release when you talk about what's happening on the inside. There's a freedom that comes when the Bible says go to somebody and confess it, get it out. Something happens, you're lighter, you sleep better. Maybe, maybe this holiday season there's someone you need to forgive. Maybe there's a relationship that you need to restore. And when we take those steps, I promise you there's a new joy that you haven't experienced in a while that'll come into your life. A new joy that you've been looking for. A new family environment. Maybe when you were a kid, you remember times where you sang around the piano as Aunt Betsy played the piano. And today everybody's locked away in different rooms on their cell phones and nobody talks. We can have healing in our relationships. If you're here today and you're already a believer but you're like, I need some healing in my life. I need, I need to do better at the relationship thing. I want to pray for you this morning. Right after that, I'm going to pray that if you're in here, today, in here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, that you could accept him today. Father, we thank you for the word today. That although we started off fun and airy and enjoying Mariah Carey, we thank you, Lord, that we could change our song from All I Want for Christmas is anybody but these people in my life to, Lord, help me to have a better relationship with them. Help me to restore. Help me to have a conversation with someone who I'm going through a very difficult time with right now, God. I thank you for wisdom coming into our minds and into our hearts. That you would empower us to work out our own salvation, our own emotional health with fear and trembling. That you would give us the power to have those conversations. I thank you, Lord, today that the joy of the Lord would be our strength this holiday season. If you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we want to pray with you today. And that prayer goes just like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Woo! I just want to take two seconds real quick. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, I just want to celebrate you real quick. If you prayed that for the first time, would you just wave at me real quick so I could celebrate you? Anybody here today? You prayed that prayer. I see you over there. Anybody else real quick? Anybody over here? I don't see anybody. We're good? Amen. All right. Anybody else real quick? Awesome. All right. We celebrate you guys. We love you. Father, we thank you for today for a word speaking to our hearts. I pray, God, for great relationships. As we leave here today, God, we are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you.